Hello, I'm Keith Callaghan and I designed the Hadron H2. Today I'm going to talk to Dougal Henshaw, um, a name I'm sure is familiar to many of you. Um, he's sailed virtually every single dinghy available, I think, um, throughout his long career. And uh, he's now a journalist and uh, specifically a reporter on um, the history of, of uh, dinghy sailing. He's written several books on the subject, in fact. So Dougal, it's nice to talk to you again. And um, I have to say, the reason we're talking today, of course, is because you have had a significant uh, involvement and contribution to the development of the H2. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes me laugh when I think about this because the whole thing kicked off uh, when I was doing an article on ageism in the sport. And I asked you, what your harrier dinghy from many years ago would be like if you were to imagine a modern version of it which would uh, filter in to the growing number of club sailors who want a boat they can sail without compromising the performance that they get and we took it from there indeed indeed um i think um uh, many people won't know about the Harrier dinghy, but I think I've got um, a photograph of, uh, of me saying, young Keith sailing uh, a Harrier. I'll just uh, I'll see if I can find it for you. <clears throat> I'm not, I think while you're looking for that, it's worth saying to people, um, the, this was a, the, uh, a very formative stage of single-handed dinghies maybe when single-handers were still viewed really as a little bit of a the the harry which of course you know came out before the laser was a great idea and now today the need for boats like that even in a very crowded single-handed market is greater than ever i think the important thing keith was and i remember having this conversation was not to get locked up into the demographics but what was far more important was the sort of people that you want and there's a, a danger that the uh, the other single handers that are currently uh, buoyant in the market and yeah you know, we're not going to denigrate them but they are very much what i'd call commodity items there's very little uh sense of ownership of these boats you know you sell one of the you know, i'm sure you can work out which ones we're referring to either the boats from the 70s or those from more recently and you sell one and you can jump from one into another and it's effectively the same boat there's no pride of ownership no sense of belonging yet if you're looking at people who are coming out of maybe the two man classes uh, and particularly, you know, again, there is now an age element in this. They're finding it difficult to get crews. And you want a boat that offers performance and consistency and all these things and fits in to that market, but at the same time keeps them with that overriding sense, this is a boat I want to own rather than just a boat that is, like I say, a commodity item that if I change it tomorrow, I won't mourn its passing. Yes, indeed. Um, the, the, um, one of the things we did when we were uh, discussing, particularly things like the buoyancy distribution, which, which probably we'll talk about a bit later, um, but also the aesthetics, we were looking at a, um, a 3D model, weren't we? And, well, uh, we did. We looked at that. We looked at many 3D models, in fact. We did. We did indeed. Um, I wonder if I can share that with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think in those the, that 3D image that you showed then and in the other ones, uh, part thing was you wanted an aesthetically pleasing boat, but it had to do a lot of things. It had to square an almost impossible circle of offering uh, a, 
a reasonable level of performance without scaring the wetsuits off sailors, which some of the boats can do. And at the same time, it's got to be manageable on shore. It's got to be recoverable if you get it wrong. And so many of these modern boats, you see them capsize. And I mean, we've all seen the pictures on yachts and yachting of various boats actually stood right up on the point of their bow because they're light and this is what can happen. And then when they try and recover, the centerboard is a, or the daggerboard is a foot in the air. And you think, how am I as a, a club sailor who's not going to the gym every week just so I can go sailing, whose exercise is going sailing, how am I going to recover from that? And I think that's where you took the matter on to the next stage and looked at the, the distribution of buoyancy and came up with really uh, what I'd say is a very novel approach. One that I didn't know how it would work. And I, mean, I saw the pictures of the internal layout. And then when I sailed it, I remember thinking, I'm not sure about that centre tunnel. And actually, I didn't pay any attention to it when I was sailing. But you know it's there and you know that this is a boat that if you do do something silly, and we all do at times, that A, the boat will look after you, but B, you can recover it. Yes, indeed. Re really, really important for a single hand, especially for single hand, as you, as you say. Yeah. And um, uh, we've got, we've actually um, uh, got a short clip of uh, of the launch day for the boat, where you you were, as you told me earlier, you were the second person to sail the prototype, <laughs> just after yes. Simon Hipkin, my business partner, yes. who who made uh, the moulds and everything. Um, so we, we were all on Tentox. It was nearly five years ago, wasn't it? Almost to the day. Um, cold it was a bloody night. cold day. I know it that. It was. It was a cold day. Autumn water, February I would just like to say that um, it was a real privilege to be the second boat, to, second person to sail the boat. And I was glad that you just wanted me to sail it and you had left it to Simon to do the, uh, the capsize for the cameras for two reasons. One, because it was that cold day and the water uh, temperature uh, to, on Alton water wasn't encouraging me to get any wetter than I was. But secondly, I would have had to have worked out how to capsize the boat because of all these boats I've sailed. And I guess you could say one of my specialities is single handers. That H2 is the most vice free of all the single handers. And actually capsizing it on purpose I had to have thought about it because at no stage, even though it was a gusty, blustery day and I'd never sailed the boat before, at no stage did I think if I'm not careful, this could have me in. And there's not many boats you can sail, I'd say that about. Uh, indeed, indeed. Um, well, um, that's a good testimonial. Now, we. Um, you obviously enjoyed that first sale because you persuaded us to lend you the boat for about a month. So I wanted to know what it was like having the boat on shore, moving it around the dinghy part, launching it, recovering it, getting the sail up and down, and then sailing it across a full spectrum of conditions. And the impressions I gained from that first sail on Alton Water were reinforced every time I sailed the boat. And then when we took the boat down to Salkham for the boat test, because I think it's worth, you know, nobody can deny the DNA parentage of the H2, 
that there's a lot of Merlin Rocket in there. So being down there in one of the spiritual homes of the Merlins, I felt was it a great selling point, actually. And it certainly added a, a degree of interest to the boat test. But all those who sail in Sorkham on a breezy day in a westerly when the wind is coming over the top of the town, know how gusty and shifty and at times unpleasant it can be. And yet I was out there bombing up and down the harbour in the H2, thinking that it was wonderful. And at no stage did it turn around and bite me. Right, I, I, I can show you a couple of uh, stills that Peter Newton took uh, now of you, you sailing uh, during that, uh, that testing session. And having sailed the boat, Peter then wanted me to capsize it for the um, for the camera. And yeah. just as again at Alton Water, I actually found it quite hard to flip the boat in, A, because I didn't want to get wet, but I wanted to do it for the camera. Yeah, anybody can capsize, but doing it on demand is not so easy. But it's amazing, as soon as I did, the boat's on its side, and the centre plate was just level with the water. And I was thinking then, you know, this gives you a confidence that if you go out and you do something silly, you fall out the boat or whatever, you can just, the boat will capsize, you can just get on the centre board and you can get it back up again. And to me, that is what a boat for club sailors is all about. And the fact that you've now attracted some very, very good sailors, you know, club level plus championship level sailors into the boat, to me is a credit for how attractive the H2 is across that spectrum of sailing. Well, thank you for that. Don't hold back, will you? <laughs> well, you know, of all the boats, like I say, I can't think of a boat that is as vice free as the H2. And of course, I, I've got two hats telling me this. There's the fact that I've sold the boat quite extensively, but also then uh, I got the, um, I was given the privilege of being your race officer. Indeed. For the National, not just once, but twice. Yes, and, and for a third time again this year, we hope as well. So I've seen the boat. Uh, and I've seen it upfront and personal. And I've also, yeah, you know, when you're race officering, you are forced to watch what goes on. And, it, and it's a, you know, if you want to know what sailing's about, be a race officer because you see everything that's going on. And what I see in the H2 is a boat that is, it's not so much that it's easy to sail, it, it's, it's, a comfortable boat to sail it's no that it's not as vice free it rewards the input that the better helms are prepared to give it and you get the you know some of those good helms that you've now got in the fleet and yet it, they they can make the boat fly it's exactly as it should be but right throughout the fleet you've got people enjoying their sailing and I think that is the key thing. Sailing should be about having fun and you've not compromised on the performance. So you get fun in the H2. And if you get too much fun, you can always get yourself back home afterwards. And that to me ticks the boxes. So yeah, I'm not gonna hold back. If I had to be in a box, tick, box ticking exercise, I'd say the boat ticks so many of them. Well, that's super. Thank you for that. Um, so what, what do you think about the, uh, the membership? I mean, they're, they're a pretty good uh, bunch, I think, don't you? I, I think the, the, the membership, Keith, um, reflects that point that I was making right the way back at the start, where you're not looking at uh, a boat uh, as a commodity item. You're looking at uh, a boat as a premium product that people want to invest in and having invested in it 
they want to maximize that investment by sailing well, going to nice sailing locations with people that they can associate with and at the same time have that fun afloat and ashore that has been maybe missing from our sport for the last 25 years where it's it's got all about you know who's been to the gym for you know every other day for the last three months before the nationals because yeah you can do that but does that still deliver the fun factor and i'm not sure it does mm, indeed um yeah we're certainly looking forward to um you coming along to our nationals at uh, herne bay in september um we've been there before and you've been race officer there before you know the club well um it was my first time there two years ago um but um i think it's a club which really matches our um the character of the class you know it's very friendly um very affable relaxed and uh, we're certainly looking forward to going there again i think the, the the key word out of all that is character you know this is the you know herne bay is a club with personality character and i think the boat is a boat with personality and character and i think that's the you know the fact that it's sailed by helm to have got it as well I think that that all complements that one thing. This isn't the uh, the why this one's the same as that one. The boats are and the boats seem remarkably uh, close to uh, being conformal to. Uh, they're all the same. You know, you get these horror stories of some boats in some classes where they don't publish a weight because one boat's X number of kilos heavier than the other. Mm. They all seem to be the same, yet they're all very, very individual. They're not all white. You've got the colours, you've got the layouts, you've got the different rig um, control set, um, systems. I mean, it was very interesting at your nationals watching the difference between those who were sailing with transom sheeting and centre sheeting and how they go about setting their boat up. And again, this is a boat that encourages that. This isn't one size fits all. This is a boat that encourages that degree of individuality, which plays into its character. Oh, that's super. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dougal. Um, I'm so pleased you like the boat as much. <laughs> I'm really uh, almost overwhelmed, actually. Thank you for that testimonial. And I think it's appropriate to, at this stage that uh, Simon Hipkin and I should publicly and demonstrably thank you for all of the input that you put in, especially in 2015 when it was just really an idea. And um, uh, we uh, we owe you quite a lot. Thanks a lot. No, no, no. It's, it's you know something, it, it, um, in the last couple of, well, in the last decade, I've been privileged to sail what I think are two of the great single handers. Um, the H2 being one and the Devotee D1 being the other. Now here you've got, and here you've got two boats that are to me are different to the, uh, the more mass produced boats. And they're boats that are all, are all full of that one word again, character. They're individual boats. And yet, and they deliver fun. So you, you're to be congratulated. And I think at this point, I've done enough damage to your <coughs> prospects for the, uh, the, but I will just go and wish you all the best for this dinghy show and for the, the season to come when it kicks off. And I'll see you in Herne Bay. Good. I hope we see you before then, but uh, thanks a lot, Dougal. Yeah, all the best. Thanks very much. Right for now. Yeah, bye.